So welcome back. Let's start our lecture. And let me start by reminding you what we did in the previous lecture. Our goal was to solve the Schrodinger problem. And the Schrodinger problem is finding solution of the Schrodinger equation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. with given initial condition, which is basically the initial quantum state. So let's call this, I don't know, psi bar of x naught. So basically what this equation is telling me is that I know the quantum state at time zero is a given function psi bar, and I want to find out the time state at time, the quantum state at time t. And in general, this is a solution of a partial differential equation with given boundary conditions and initial conditions, and that's a difficult problem. And what we did through Feynman path integral is to obtain an explicit construction of the solution of this problem. And the way we did that was first to introduce the concept of propagator, noting that the uh, wave function at time t could be constructed from the wave function at time zero by defining an object which basically takes that wave function and evolves it forward in time. And we noted there was an analogy between this convolution with a kernel and some source term uh, with the solution of the Poisson equation for electrostatics in terms of a convolution integral, given the Coulomb form for the solution of the Laplace equation, essentially. Um, then, of course, we explicitly constructed this object, which is the Feynman propagator, and reduced the calculation of this object into quadrature. So let me remind you uh, about all of this. This guy here, the quantum propagator, or the Feynman propagator, as sometimes it is called, it is actually defined as the matrix element of the quantum evolution operator. In position representation. And in most of the lectures, we have set t naught to zero, and I will occasionally I think it's a good thing to do even here so we should not go around keeping this index and then we what we were doing we were giving a, an explicit representation of this matrix element in terms of an infinite dimensional integral which we write as follows We use a different notation here. Okay, so in this equation, and is a normalization factor which comes from uh, the normalization of a number of Gaussian integral and I'm using inverted comma for Gaussian integrals because they were Gaussian integral with an i in the exponent so not really Gaussian there so you can think about it as some analytic continuation of the Gaussian integral whatever uh, this symbol here what it really meant was a very large sequence of space integral which corresponding to integrating over the position of the particle in any intermediate time between the zero and t time and this you can think about it as an infinite sequence of uh, Feynman slits experiments in which the particle can travel and reach the target by many different trajectories so basically this implements this idea of uh, having an initial state here, a final state here, and having many, many, many possible ways in which you can connect the states. Now, I should probably erase this 
and show it here. It's probably better. So I got my initial state, my final state, and at every intermediate time, I'm integrating over the position the particle at the intermediate time. And this provides a path. Now, what this symbol here means is that you have many of such integrals, and how many you have depends how small you want the time discretization to be. And we had a discussion that the time discretization uh, in physics, or any discretization effect in physics, uh, can be related with this idea of having a cutoff where the resolution of the theory and your model is. And, and if your model is, is supposed to be correct up to some resolution scale dictated by some manager scale lambda, you want h bar over t to be of order uh, larger than lambda, so that you are not able to resolve in low energy dynamics, uh, the, the low energy dynamics is not sensitive to the physics that occurs at a scale h bar over delta t or larger. Um, this object here was represented in this uh, sort of a descriptive form as follows. I'm noticing that it is not quite visible in the screen, so let me rewrite it again in a way that you can read it. Let's see. No, this is still too low. Fortunately, my blackboard, whiteboard is not perfectly synchronized with the one on the screen, so let me write it again here. P tau, and then 2m minus u of q. Now, I let me remind you that, in fact, this is just a notation, because everything we were working with corresponded to non-differentiable paths of the form of those which are reported here, consisting of a finite but very large amount of time intervals, of, uh, of uh, spatial intervals. And the idea of condensing, taking a continuum limit, and taking the infinite number of frames limit is more of a compact notation than a physical thing. In physics, you actually never take that limit all through because of the renormalization group and ideas and, and concepts that we discussed before. So, similarly, this is not really a kinetic energy because the paths are not differentiable. What it really means is that this is, is a way of writing something with a continuum formalism which should be interpreted as its discretization version, which is, in this case, of course, sum over the frames with a delta t, and then I have like qk plus 1 minus qk squared divided by 2 delta t squared m minus u calculated in qk. And it is quite possible that I've used a different notation for the integration variable and, 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 and extremes of the integrations um, in the previous lecture, but I, I guess we are on the same basis of the main concepts that we have done here at this level. Okay, so what we're going to do today is to dig a little bit further into these equations and try to understand what to take out of it. Uh, there are many things, and we will not be able to cover this in a lecture. As a matter of fact, we will need at least one course to cover all of the implications of the path integral formalisms, uh, uh, or at least some of the relevant implications of it, given that it's a widespread methodology. But I want to focus on three main aspects. Remember, in the previous lectures, we mentioned the fact, we mentioned the fact that Feynman's path integral and in general, quadrature reduction of complicated PDE problems are useful for three main reasons. Number one, they provide the platform for performing computer simulations, and we will discuss that perhaps later this day. Number two, they provide a platform for performing approximations, and number three, they provide physical insights. So let me start from the, uh, the third uh, of these uh, three points, physical insights. We already discussed in the previous lecture that one of the incredible advantages of path integral formulations is that it provides us with a, a 
Victorian representation of quantum mechanics that is physically transparent. What I mean by that? You know, when we look at the Schrodinger problem, the wave function, it doesn't tell us much. It just is a prescription of things we have to do in order to make predictions for observables. We have to solve the Schrodinger equation, take the square root, say, take the expectation values of operators, and that will be predictions for the average results of performing a measurement on the system. What is a wave function remains extremely, extremely mysterious in quantum mechanics, and and we remain even in path integral formulation, but what a path integral formulation does, it represents quantum dynamics in terms of classical concepts, concepts like trajectories. We were told that trajectories are no longer useful after you discover uncertainty principle, and what Feynman's path integral do, uh, they get it back. Although you have to integrate over infinitely many trajectories to get a quantum prediction. So now the question that I would like to uh, pose to you today is, uh, well, among all the trajectories that are supposed to be taken by a quantum particle to go from some point x naught to some point xf in time, let's see if my computer wakes up. Yes, it is woken up. We discussed yesterday quantum path take any possible way to go from these two points. These are two different quantum paths. And they should all contribute to the path integral. Question is, I have two questions to rise now. Are these paths all equally important? Or some paths are more important than others? And uh, this is question number two. What is the role of the classical trajectories in all this? I mean, after all, the classical trajectory connecting XF and XI, or the classical trajectories, there could be more than one because this is not a Cauchy problem, it's a boundary of our problems, there is no uniquity solution. The Earth could go around the, the Sun clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the initial condition, there would be perfectly legitimate solutions of Newton's equation. Uh, so, in this, uh, in this framework, where is the classical trajectory? Let me draw it in red here. What is the role of the classical trajectory? The computer doesn't seem to be waking up. Let's wait. It's taking very long. There we go. It's very slow today. Okay. Uh, so, to answer this question, let me go back to the expression that we had yesterday. And and make a simple comment. So that's my path integral, that's my, loosely speaking, expression for the path integral. Now, if this term here was positive definite, in other words, if I didn't have an i here, then I could interpret this as a probability density for the path. And it would be very simple to say, okay, not all paths contribute equally. Some paths contribute with higher density, probability density. Some paths are more probable, and some other paths are less probable. And that's exactly the kind of situation we will encounter when we use path integral representations for stochastic problems in statistical physics. But in quantum mechanics, this is complex, and this is complex too. And therefore, I do not have a simple probabilistic interpretation. So there is no such a thing as a probability of a path in the path integral representation. There is some kind of a phase associated to the path. So in the path integral formalism, we know that the quantum amplitude from the initial to final point is obtained by summing all possible phase contributions, each one coming from a different path. Now, uh, let's go back to our questions. Are all paths equally relevant? Well, we know that whenever we sum objects with very different phases, then typically they interfere destructively because there are many ways that you can sum up phases in random ways and get in zero interference, basically noise out of it. That's what happens if you open your uh, radio and you just, you know, synchronize on a random frequency uh, you get just white noise. Um, however, 
what happens, and this situation is particularly severe, whenever the typical values of the actions for, say, two different paths, let me take a small perturbation of the path, take another path, This is, for instance, one path, and the other one is a small perturbation. This is Q plus delta Q. This is Q. Okay, this is not feasible. Let me write it here. And whenever this difference in some models is, say, much larger than h bar, then typical small variation of the path will induce large dephasing in the exponent. The phases will be very different, and random phase added together will give you noise and zero, essentially. They will be equally important. Not necessarily zero, but noise, because when you integrate many quantities that are random, you do have to account for all of them, but you don't have any main mean to prefer one to the other. However, among all of these paths that widely interfere, there will be some for which this difference is small. And I'm waiting for the computer to wake up for some reason. Okay, this difference to be small. If I can find a path which are this very, very specific property that around these paths, the action basically doesn't change, then this small finite measure set of paths will have constructive interference. And therefore, their contribution to the path integral will stand out with respect to the others, because if, while all the others basically interfere widely with no particular pattern, pattern, this one will provide a coherent interference. And this is called what is called the, the stationary phase approximation and this is one of the um, fundamental tools you use in quantum mechanics for instance to get a WKB approximation that is a semi-classical approximation of quantum mechanics even in the path in the um, wave function formalism so what does the phase uh, stationary phase approximation say it says that if I'm looking at, suppose I have a, my action functional S, which is a function of my path, and suppose I, again, perturb the path. Now, there will be, then that means that I can sort of functionally expand this to be the path at the beginning plus some functional variation with respect to the path times the difference between the path, plus second-order functional variations. What is a functional variation? Here will be clear and discussed more in detail in a minute. For the time being, let me just try it as a qualitative concept. We will discover that these objects here actually are, there's some systematic difference between a functional variation and a function variation, so that this is not trivially uh, Newton's expansion. We will need to think a little bit through, because, it's, because functionals are functions of infinitely many variables. But notwithstanding these mathematical complicancies, which I will care about in a minute, what I want to say is that the path for which the, path for which the action remains coherent the longest are those for which there's no linear variation, the stationary point of the action. And for this path, you need to go one order next in the functional Taylor expansion before you start noticing some difference. This is exactly the, the same situation we have in normal calculus when you have a point of minimum. And the point of minimum is special because if you, per, if you, if you move a little bit around the minimum point, the function, the, the function remains stationary, and you really have to travel a little long distance before you can notice quadratic corrections. 
Now the same things happens at this level, at the level of functional and not of functions in terms of action. So the path, the maximal interfere, the minimal interfere, really the maximally coherent uh, contribution to Feynman pathentropies are those for which the variation are the solution of the problem. Let's find a stationary point in the action. And we all know from our classical mechanics that this leads to Lagrange equations. And we know that Lagrange equations are basically Newtonian. So we are answering here the question, do all paths matter the same? Well, and the answer is, at the very large values of actions compared to h bar, only only those that are very, 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 very close to the stationary point of the action really matter, because all the others would just widely interfere. So what we are discovering here is that in the limit of h bar going to zero, then s over h bar is a large number, and then only classical path will not interfere out. But if you if you think about it in a in, in a little bit of a more if you give it some thought, you might say, oh wait a minute, the classical paths are provide a set with zero measure in an integral. It's like a point in a normal integral. How can an integral be dominated by a point? And in fact, it is not dominated by a point. What we actually are saying is that I have my set of quantum paths. Some of them are very different. And then there's a classical path. And there's a small bundles of quasi-classical paths. Now, what I'm saying is that the classical solution of uh, Newton's equations provides the mean field for this bundle of paths, which means that basically it, are, it is a representative element that combines at mean field level all of the physics of these highly constructively interfering paths that travels around it. And that's how the classical behaviors emerges out of quantum mechanics. And I want to emphasize, this is really remarkable. Because, you see, if you try to deduce classical mechanics from Schrodinger equations in the wave function formalism, you have to go through Aaron first relationships, and, and they're not very transparent. At least they're not to me. In this case, it is clear, classical trajectories still play a role in the path integral. However, they do so by representing a set of finite measure paths, narrowly focused around the classical path. In the limit in which h bar goes to zero, all other paths interfere out. You get zero, null, zero results. What happens if uh, what happens if h bar is not equal to zero? Or of course h bar is h bar, whatever it is, it is a constant. What really matters is the values of parameters that enter in the action. So what if the action, the typical action of the path you're looking at, divided by each path, is actually not a small number? Come on, wake up. My computer is still sleeping. There we go. What happens if you are in this regime? Well, that means that there is a basically all path that I can draw have comparable actions 
Maybe they're different from one another, but they are much smaller than h bar. Well, that means that they will all constructively interfere in the phase, which means that a path integral we will have will have to take into account of all of these paths, right? So basically, what this is telling me is that in the limit in which h bar is a large quantity compared to the typical values of the actions, you cannot just retain narrow path in the vicinity of the classical path. That is not an option, because this is not representative of the path that will constructively interfere. OK, so that we understand how classical mechanics pops out out of quantum mechanics. I just want to make one little comment. And the comment is, the classical path is very different from any other path in the path integral actually does not belong to the path integral at all. Because, you see, the classical path is the solution of a true differential equation, the Newton's equation, while the other paths are all non-differentiable in n points, n minus 1 points. Remember, they're all segments. So, basically, what the classical path does is an analytic solution excuse me, it's an analytic solution for a mean field. And we will discover in, in this course and perhaps in other courses in statistical mechanics that many systems that have uh, stochastic behavior are based on functions that are never continuous, but the mean field equations are continuous. And if you have ever seen the Landau systems, the Landau um, theory for, say, ferromagnetic transition, you will find something very similar. You have mean field equation for the Landau field, uh, which provides perfectly fine, smooth solutions, but the stochastic realization of the spin field density uh, are never continuous, never differentiable. Okay, I want to spend one more minute uh, going back, if my computer wakes up, Come on, having a problem with connection today. Okay. Um, we were discussing functional integration and functional differentiation. We already spent some time in defining functional differentiation. I want to spend some time in, in now discussing function, uh, sorry, we spent some time on functional integration and we said functional integral. To understand what a functional integral is, basically, what you need to do is to think about it as a collection of regular integrals. Possibly with some product of normalization terms, and I remember there was an n minus 2, and there was a sort of h bar and whatever here. That was the normalization coming from the Gaussian integration that was producing the path integral. Uh, so, the key to understand this symbol here was to translate it into what it really means. It means a collection of infinitely many classical normal integrals. So, a functional integral is nothing more than a very large dimensional Lebesgue's or Riemann's integral, depending on what measure you're looking at. I never really think in terms of Lebesgue's, that's my fault. I can only understand Riemann's integral when it comes to path integral, but that's perhaps my, my, my weakness in that. So what is a functional differentiation? Well, the trick in understanding functional differentiation is always, always discretize. Because after you discretize, you go to the explicit discrete representation, then any, any tool you develop in functional calculus just translates into normal calculus. And therefore, you can work with the rules you learned second year in college to work out the results. Let me give an example. Let me build, let me start by something that we probably is easiest to understand. Suppose we want to take, we have two functions, we want to perform 
this calculation or well actually let's actually do the the exercise which is perhaps more relevant I want to study I want to derive Lagrange's equation from this expression so remember what we want to do here is to take the variation and set it to zero. Well, there are many ways to do that, but, but I think the best way for the purpose of this discussion is that of saying, okay, let me write S of Q as a sum of a delta T, then I have a QK plus 1 minus QK squared divided by 2M minus U K. And then I want to see how this functional changes if I change my path Q. And the way I do, but now after I discretize this, my path is just Q, tau, is basically a, a large dimension of action, Q1, Qn, where Q1, Qn is just the value of the path at different time intervals, time 1, T2, T3, that's Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on, so on and so forth. So basically, what it comes, what it boils down to, is to, to if I want to understand the variation of this functional in terms of the path, is to do a Taylor expansion in the large dimensional space of n variables. So let's do that. Let me use the upper part of the board. So the idea is to take the derivative with respect to any of this point and set it to zero. That's the gradient, right? So I will do the partial derivative of my function with respect to an arbitrary point QL. And this is sum over K delta T d by dql and then I will have 2 qk plus 1 minus qk divided by 2m and this is acting on this and then of course this is true if and only l is equal either to k plus 1 or to k This to read grandly. And now I have negative. Oh, sorry. This is actually gone. And then I'm having. This I can check here, B. And then I'm having d by dql of the potential, which is basically u prime of qk delta of k l. Now, if I combine all this, you see, what I will get here is something that should be reminiscent. And, I, and remember, I want to find stationary points, so I have to set this to zero. Now, after I do that, I notice that the expression I get is something like k plus 1 plus qk minus 1 minus 2 qk delta t squared is equal to negative times m negative u prime qk. That's a, you know, the, the different terms comes from combining all this term here. And that's nothing but the Newton's equation. Because this is the discretized version 
of the acceleration, this is the mass, and this is simply mass times acceleration is negative force. You can work out the details here, probably you have to shift k and gain k plus 2, k minus 1, and, and things like this, but in the end of the day that's what sort of comes out. Okay, so what this is exercise is sort of telling you is that functional differentiation and functional integration can be easily understood by going to the discretized version of it, which is actually what they mean for physicists, and then working out the expression in calculus. And then if you want, go back to the continuum limit, if you want to, you know, be elegant and write this as you can always say, okay, if n is very large, let me just say that this is like saying this, which is Newton's equation. So that's how you work out uh, functional differentiation in, in, in practice in a very large number of cases. After a while, you, you learn rules in order to do that without having to go through the discretization procedure and do it right away, remaining in the function of formalism. But for the sake of understanding what's going on, I think this is quite instructive. Okay, so now let's move forward and touch on one additional point of our lectures. What we said so far concerns the theoretical implications of path integral, the insight you get for path integrals, because you understand how classical mechanics emerges out of quantum fluctuations. But also, it is considered as a platform for approximations, because if you are in fact in a regime in which h bar is not large compared to typical variations of actions between different paths, then you don't need to solve the path integral. You can only focus on the trajectories because your path integral will be dominated by the classical trajectory. So rather than solving quantum mechanics, you can actually solve a, a simplified version of it that is called classical mechanics. And this is, of course, very, very valuable. Um, this Two considerations concern point two and three of our uh, list of advantages of reducing the probability to, con to quadrature. Uh, the, prob the, the, the first item in this list was the possibility of performing numerical simulations and using computers. And we were saying, we were arguing or hand wavingly that solving integrals is simpler than solving partial differential equations. So now we're going to go a little bit further into that. And um, Solving path integral is, is, in quantum mechanics, with classical computers, is basically impossible. First of all, we don't even know if the path integral is actually convergent or not. Uh, there is a flourishing field in which uh, the problem of solving quantum dynamics problem, in an, including quantum path integral in some sense, uh, is best addressed using quantum computers. But this is very far from the topic of the present course, and I will not touch that, and I'm not an expert on that either. So, a couple of good reasons for not entering that territory. Um, as far as uh, classical computer is concerned, uh, we do not have any ways of attacking the problem of computing that path integral just by using, say, Simpson rules or even Monte Carlo methods. But you can get a wealth of information out of it by looking at some analytic continuation of that path integral. So what we're going to talk about now is path integral in imaginary time. My hand script is getting worse and worse by the hour as I give these lectures. And um, 
So what is the idea? Let me write again my path integral. The path integral is basically this guy, and it's written the for opsi Okay, now the idea is to not look at this path integral onto the real axis where t is performed, but to consider a more general standpoint in which t is promoted to be a complex variable, which means that I can look at this value along the real axis, or I can look at this value along any point on the complex plane and in particular, I can travel and look at the value of the actions on the imaginary plane. So, in other words, I perform the analytic continuation, which is not a change of variable. It is an analytic continuation, t going into minus i tau. So, I want to emphasize that what I'm looking at here is t the original time t is real, but now even this variable tau is real, which means that I'm not just replacing a real variable with a complex variable. I'm just looking at the function uh, at the variable t as a complex variable. So far, in the standard quantum mechanics formalism, only the real axes matter. And now we are looking, we choose to look at something else. We look at the same mathematical object onto the imaginary axis. Why do we want to do such a thing? Why should physics on this imaginary axis have anything to do with physics in reality? Of course, that's a, that's a, that's a serious problem. And it turns out that uh, while there are certainly, certainly uh, you don't get access to all the information you can get on the real axis, you might get access to some of the information about your system by just looking at the imaginary axis, quantum propagator. So what is called the Vick rotation. And looking at the path integral in this direction is actually called imaginary time path integral. So, If I perform a Vick rotation, what I'm basically looking at is a different object. Well, let me do this. I'm looking at a different matrix element. I could have started directly saying, well, I'm not interested in this path integral here. I'm interested in this matrix element. Uh, let's see what I get which is equivalent to say, I started off with this, and in order to make calculation, I cannot calculate that on a computer. Let me calculate its analytic continuation into the imaginary plane, which is this one downstairs. Now, when you look at the, uh, the definition of the actions, you will see all you have to do is to replace any time you see t, negative i tau. And now you will discover that uh, you have t here, you have t here, and you don't have t here in the action. I'm sorry, this is not visible in the screen, so let me rewrite it. When I look at the action, which enters here, and I want to do the analytic continuation, all I have to do is to take, say, this is my final time, and I call in the integration time t, not to mess up with this new variable tau, and I have 2 prime over 2 m minus u of q, and I have to replace t equals negative r tau here, and t equals negative i tau here. So what it happens, it happens that this one affects both u and q, while there will be two times entering the second, the square of the, of the time derivative, which will generate 
and I square corrections, which flips the sign of the kinetic energy relative to the potential energy. So, after you take into account of all this, what you discover is that this path integral is written into a different form in which don't, you don't have any more an I, but you have a 1 there, and the Euclidean action that enters there is basically I have a notation problem. Okay, I can leave this tau here. I'll leave it here. And let me call it tau prime here. And this is basically the second derivative plus the potential. So basically the Hamiltonian. So if I want to study path integral imaginary time, I basically have the same mathematical constructions. And everything that I have to take care of is that now I don't have an i floating in the, in the exponent, in the integral, but I have a 1. And instead of the action, I have a modified action, or so-called Euclidean action, where kinetic energy and potential energy are summed. So it's not a time integral of the Lagrangian, it's a time integral of the Hamiltonian. Well, that's uh, just a mathematical consequence of the structure of the subjects. There's nothing deep in that at least at the level of understanding how the derivation goes. But the point is that solving this guy on a computer is immensely, infinitely more handy than trying to solve this guy here. And the reason is that this object down here has the interpretation of the probability density of a path now because it's a positive definite function depending on the path and can be bounded from 0 to 1 if you want, with proper normalization. Since the action is positive definite, remember the action is the time integral of the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is positive definite if you are up to a constant that you can always take out. So it's bounded from below, the only thing you want is the Hamiltonian to be bounded from below, and if the Hamiltonian is bounded from below, then this is a proper probability test. And what does this mean in practice? It means that if I go back to a discretized version now, my path integral in imaginary time is written as a collection of variables, and then I have an exponent, and then I have a sum of terms like this. Q, Q, I'm a being, let me, I have a problem with consistency on rotation, D, Q, 1, D, Q, N, Q, K, plus 1, minus Q, K, U, K. I think this could be correct. And again, remember, the last of this is actually X, so Q, n plus 1 is actually x, and q0 is actually y, or something like that. Now, the point is that after I go back to the discretized form, this has the structure of a canonical partition function in statistical mechanics, equivalent to a canonical partition function in classical mechanics, statistical mechanics. 
where the role of temperature is placed by the 1 over h bar that sits down here. That's the role of the Kb in classical mechanics. So basically, quantum fluctuations in imaginary time become equivalent to thermal fluctuations at fixed temperature. So what we're discovering is that if I look at the system in imaginary time, then my quantum dynamics is equivalent to a collection of classical partition of an extended partition functions in large number of dimension corresponding one for one copy of the system for each time frame in imaginary time and in each of these time frame I'm weighting the energy the potential energy but I'm connecting these time frames with an harmonic force so basically my quantum imaginary problem quantum problem in imaginary time is equivalent to a statistical problem classical statistical problem in which I have many copies of the systems each of which with its own u delta t over h bar contribution, and then I have an harmonic bond between all these. What is this harmonic bond? Is qk plus 1 minus qk squared divided by 2n delta, with delta t down here. So basically I'm replacing a single system with the polymers of system, the first bit corresponds to the imaginary time tau equal to zero tau prime. This is tau prime is equal to delta t, and this is tau prime is equal to tau. So the statistical weight of my quantum path in imaginary time is the statistical weight of a large dimensional polymer. And why do I want to care about this? analogy? Well, because I have methods to solve statistical mechanics uh, for canonical systems, and these are called Monte Carlo methods. Metropolis, for instance, Monte Carlo, but many other. The Metropolis is just one possibility, there are many other opportunities for doing Monte Carlo. But basically, I can use stochastic methods such as Monte Carlo to sample the statistical mechanics of this ring in this extension, extended space. And if I do that, then I get access to properties that concern the quantum dynamics in imaginary time. Okay, so now we discussed that we can use um, statistical methods, typically Monte Carlo methods to sample the path integral or correlation functions to more, more appropriately in imaginary time. Now the question is why should we care about the imaginary time? What is the advantage? What can we get out of imaginary time dynamics? Um, and in order to see that, in order to see that, let's, uh, let's, go, let's look at the simplest object we can think in imaginary time. Maybe this is not the one that I would directly evaluate with Monte Carlo because that's a propagator and not a correlation function, but that's a technical issue. But let's, let's look at the dynamics in imaginary time by looking at the quantum correlator the quantum propagator in imaginary time. Now, to understand what physics can be extracted from it, let me stick one again here. But this time I resolve the identity with a new set of complete orthonormal states. Not the position eigenstates, not the momentum eigenstates. This time I'm looking at the Hamiltonian eigenstates. I don't know them, because if I knew them, then I would have solved the problem in the first place. But even if I know them, don't know them, I know they exist. And therefore they can be used in this relationship, which in turn will give me e to the minus e con an e n over tau over h bar, and then I will get psi n star y psi n of x. This is psi n. Now, 
in the limit in which the time becomes much larger, the h bar over say h1 e1 minus e naught, negative e naught. So the gap between say the ground state and the first excited state, then this exponent is dominated. This sum is exponentially dominated by the ground state. So in this limit, this guy will become e to the negative e naught two over h bar times sine naught star y sine naught of x plus exponentially small corrections coming from all the other states. Now clearly from this equation it's clear that imaginary time propagation will give you information about the ground state wave function and the ground state energy. For example, by taking the logarithm of this guy and looking at the slope, this is the logarithm of the Poincaré propagator, this is Euclidean time, when the logarithm of this guy would become a negative line, then the slope of this line would be proportional to the energy of the ground state. Conversely, the intercept would be proportional to the wave function. So this will tell you that basically imaginary time of Vic rotated Vic rotation time, let me say it here, Vic rotation plus quantum Monte Carlo will give me information about ground state. Uh, ground state is, is not all there is in a, in a quantum system, obviously, but it's a, it's a fairly good start. And especially if you're interested in, say, quantum chemistry, it's basically all you really almost always care. Because uh, in the born oppenheimer approximation, the effective interaction between the nuclei in a macromolecule, for instance, are dictated by the ground state um, energy of the electronic structure given fixed position of the nuclei, just as an example. Um, so imaginary time is in principle a way to extract very valuable information. Okay, so I think we covered all three points in these lectures. I want to give one last point. I want to give a one more point. And it's let me consider now a slightly different object. Let me consider the following object, the path integral. Oh, actually, let me start from a slightly different point. Suppose we are now interested in quantum thermodynamics. For instance, we want to study equilibrium property in a canonical system for the quantum point of view. Well, then what we have to compute is basically the quantum partition function. And the quantum partition function can be taken in many ways. It's basically the trace of e to the minus beta v Hamiltonian operator. Now, if I evaluate this trace in position representation, I get this expression, which basically means that I'm looking at the following expression. This is basically a path integral performed over all possible paths that start and end in the same point. And since this is a translational invariant system, I can actually fix this point x and do it for one point x, as long as my integral is circular. So I'm looking at all paths. So by looking at periodic path integrals, I have now a way of studying quantum thermodynamics. So to summarize, I have my Feynman path integral, And if I do a Vic rotation, I can either find the Euclidean Feynman path integral, 
from which I can get ground state properties in vacuum without any thermal effects. Or still when I do Vic rotation, I can look at periodic path integral with period beta. Beta plays the role of time. I cannot see this here. Let me rewrite this part here. I do take the integral over x, x, and then I look at the path integral in imaginary time for a time extent beta. Well, this is again a path integral now with circular paths, and its physical interpretation is that of a quantum partition function. So, for instance, by taking the derivative of this guy with respect to temperature or other parameters, I get the, uh, the state functions of an equilibrium system, including quantum effects to all of them. So, now you see. From this discussion, it is clear that doing quantum dynamics in imaginary time is a convenient object that you can use in the path integral Monte Carlo, allows you to use statistical methods devised to study canonical system, and in view of this statistical method, you can actually either get ground state properties or get thermodynamic properties. So, in essence, we have seen that not only is path integral formulation of quantum mechanics useful to understand quantum mechanics in terms of classical concepts, but it also paves the way to perform the classical approximation, and it also paves the way to perform computer simulations of either ground state properties of my quantum system or thermal properties of my quantum system. Okay, I think that's it for this lecture, and uh, we'll see how to move on in the future to other applications of pathological formulation. Bye-bye.